Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 253 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. What can a family history tell us about revolutionary and early Republic America? What can the letters of a wife and mother tell us about life in the Caribbean during the age of revolutions? These are questions that Susan Claire Imbarato, a professor of English at Minnesota State University Moorhead, set out to answer as she explored an amazing trove of letters to and from a woman named Sarah Gray Carey. So today, we're going to join Susan on an exploration of Sarah Gray Carey's life to discover more about how Carrie experienced the American Revolution on the island of Grenada, as well as different aspects of her life on that island. And during our exploration, Susan reveals why the letters of Sarah Gray Carey are remarkable and what they can reveal about the Age of Revolutions. Details about the lives of Sarah Gray Carey and her family, and the different ways the American Revolution impacted the Carey family's ability to stay together and make money in the transatlantic economy. But first, Did you know that Ben Franklin's World has a listener community on Facebook? The Ben Franklin's World listener community is a place for people like you. People who love history and want to know more about the early American past. It's a place where we can all gather, chat as we have time, and pose any questions we have about history. It's also a place where you can help inform our future episodes. Have you ever wondered how listener questions appear in the show? They appear because Holly White and I ask you to submit them in the Facebook group. Now, joining the Ben Franklin's World listener community is really easy. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com and click on the listener community button right on the homepage. It's right there on the top of the sidebar, so you can't miss it. Okay, are you ready to meet Sarah Gray Carey and learn more about how she and her family experienced the American Revolution in Grenada? Allow me to introduce you to our guest scholar. Our guest is a professor of English at Minnesota State University, Moorhead. She's the author of numerous books, including Traveling Women, Narrative Visions of Early America, Declarations of Independency in 18th Century American Autobiography, and most recently, Sarah Gray Carey from Boston to Grenada, Shifting Fortunes of an American Family, 1764 to 1826. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Susan Claire Imbarato. Thank you, Liz. I'm just thrilled to be here. Thank you. So, Susan, Your book, Sarah Gray Carey, From Boston to Grenada, centers on the history and story of the Carey family. And to tell this story, it really relies on the remarkable letters of the family's matriarch, Sarah Gray Carey. So I wonder if you would tell us about Sarah Carey's letters and why they captivated you. I found them by reading a 1891 edition of the letters by their great-granddaughter, and I became just immediately engaged in how thoughtful she is as a writer, the scope of her subjects from anything from literary matters to philosophy to religious matters to social matters. And so then I wanted to know more about her recipients, which led me on almost a 10-year investigation. When I was in Boston, I would stop by the Massachusetts Historical Society. And as I kept reading them, the story unfolded that I became just really interested in. And I wanted to know more about the family, their circumstances. So that's how I started. And it was watching history unfold on a really personal level. And so that also really drew me in. You mentioned that Sarah Carey was a very thoughtful letter writer. Are there any examples you could share with us so that we can get a sense of who she was as a writer and for the different topics she wrote about? Her first letters are to her sister-in-law, Mary Gray Otis. And This is when Sarah had relocated to Grenada. And so the letters were really her lifeline to her life back in Boston and then Chelsea. And so there's a sense of her identity where she is still transitioning, you know, to her island life, having grown up in a relatively cosmopolitan Boston of the 1750s and 60s. And so those letters are, you know, about motherhood, about everyday life. And then she begins to sort of 
feel a little bit insecure and compares herself to the ladies of fashion in Boston. And her life is much more domesticated. You know, she's both the school teacher and the mother at the same time. So I thought those letters were interesting, just reflections on not only what it meant to be a colonial American woman at the time, but also what it meant to be somewhat exiled from your homeland. In her letters to her son, Samuel, that began when he returned from schooling in London, they write on everything from Cicero to Shakespeare to laundry and, you know, family matters. So she really covers a lot of ground in her letters. You also mentioned that by reading through Sarah Carey's letters and all the letters that people wrote back to Sarah, that you were able to watch history unfold. As you watch the Carey family's history unfold, Did you have to take any of the information in these different letters that you read and compare them with other historical sources so that you could better understand the details that you were reading about? Right. So the letters are the primary source. And then I also used newspapers of the day, interesting local histories that were written at the turn of the century. And then as I dug deeper, I was looking at business ledgers, shipping records, wills, were interesting too, because they gave me a lot of information about families. And then the New England Genealogical Historical Society was a great source of genealogical information. And then a real boon was uncovering the Reverend Thomas Carey's diary, the brother of Samuel, who kept a meticulous diary and was thankfully transcribed by the society. So one thing led to another. And the materials that I wasn't sort of thinking about initially, I had to reposition my understanding of where the information was. Like I wanted them to write a letter that said, I did this. So I had to reconstruct from the other primary sources, not only the environment they were living in, but details about what ship was she on and how could that have occurred. There was a section when they talked about the Quasi War. And so that was interesting to sort of figure out how that played a big part in the disruption of the family correspondence. So I was learning a lot about history just through their correspondence as well. Okay, now that we know more about these remarkable sources that informed your project and led you to research Sarah Carey and her family, I wonder if you would introduce us to the Carey family. So would you tell us about the woman behind all these letters, Sarah Gray Carey? She came from a founding colonial family. Her father, Ellis Gray, was the reverend at the Second Church, which later became the New Brick Church, which had been a Mather Church. And then her mother, Sarah Brame Tyler Carey, was also part of a founding family. She was born in 1753. Unfortunately, her father died before she was born. And so she never knew her father. She was raised, obviously, by her mother and then her uncles. But she grew up in a really bustling, you know, like a Bostonian family. There's a very close extended network of church membership and families. Again, it's interesting that she didn't have access to her father, but her father's presence loomed large in not only her religious grounding, but also the fact that the Gray family had a standing in revolutionary America. During the Boston Massacre, Samuel Gray was shot. And I, again, these tangled cousin genealogical lines are a little bit hard, but I think I can say with some confidence that that was one of her cousins. She herself is probably known better because of her connection to Mercy Otis Warren, who was also connected through marriage as cousins. So it sounds like Sarah was from an elite, but not too elite family. Like this family was well connected, but not so well connected that we remember them as a famous family. Right. So they weren't of the mercantile class. They were of the church membership class. But certainly she had access to a good education in terms of her brothers and tutoring. And she met Samuel at a ball that was put on by Samuel Otis. So she did run in those circles. Yeah, it definitely sounds like she ran through elite circles. Speaking of which, could you tell us more about Sarah Carey's relationship with her cousin through marriage, Mercy Otis Warren? Right. So they were connected through marriage, as I just mentioned, and they held not an extensive correspondence, but an important one for both of them. So when Mercy Otis Warren was going through some tragic moments with loss in her own family, she would write to her dear friend, Sarah. And then when Sarah was in Grenada, she would write. It allowed, I think, especially for Sarah, a chance to connect with not only a woman, but someone that was you know, outside of her very active domestic life with eventually with 13 children. 
they were very thoughtful. They did have a reunion. Sarah went to visit her. And as Sharon Harris and Jeffrey Richards have written in their book, one of the last letters that Marissa Otis Warren wrote was to Sarah Carey. I'm curious about the contents of these letters, because we know from our conversation with Rosemarie Zagari in episode 145 that Mercy Otis Warren liked to discuss politics in her letters, and that she particularly liked to discuss politics in her letters with Abigail Adams. Did Mercy Otis Warren ever discuss politics with Sarah Gray Carey? Mercy Otis Warren talked a lot about social issues, especially religious issues. And then there's one letter where she says, but my dear, gentle friend, something like that, Sarah, surrounded by her domestic life. So I think she appreciated that Sarah was more engaged with what was happening in her immediate sphere. Interestingly, their daughter, Margaret Carey, who was interested in Swedenborg, apparently had a connection with Mercy Otis Warren as well. So those connections were there, but again, more of an emphasis on matters of the heart or matters of family seemed to be the focus of their letters. And would you tell us a little bit about Emanuel Swedenborg? He was a early 19th century religious figure that Margaret seemed to be attracted to. So this is not in the letters themselves, but it's just part of the overall biography that's part of the Curtis edition of the family letters. And as we're speaking about Sarah Carey's family members, in 1772, Sarah Gray married Samuel Carey. Would you tell us a bit about the man that Sarah married? Right. So he also comes from a founding colonial family. He's the, I think, the third generation of merchants. They were founders of Charlestown. And the portrayal of his relationship with his father, Captain Samuel Carey, is interesting. His brother, the Reverend Thomas Carey, went to Harvard. In the uh, Curtis edition, it says that Samuel also was a graduate of Harvard, but I couldn't find any distinct record in contacting, you know, the Harvard Library Archivist. So I don't know if that's true, but it's true that when Samuel was of age, his father gave him a legacy of something like a thousand pounds and said, take this and go to the West Indies. So Samuel was really keen on making his own mark. So in 1763, after the Seven Years' War, he did, with his father's blessing and letters of introduction, embark on this big journey. It seemed to be a very attractive direction for young men at that time to make their fortunes in what looked like an ongoing potential for money, the West Indies. So when he initially met Sarah, the depictions of him from his daughter, Margaret, are of this very wealthy planter coming into Boston with his carriage and his servants. And so he was an attractive figure on several levels. Do we know what it was about the West Indies that attracted Samuel and other young men to move there during the mid to late 18th century? I mean, how did they plan to make their fortunes in the Caribbean? Right. It seemed to be that the transatlantic sugar trade and obviously the connections to the slave trade seemed to be the way for New Englanders as well as you know, the colonists on all down the eastern seaboard. It was very lucrative. His salaries were extraordinarily significant. I don't want to quote without exact figures, but he does write in a letter where he's making, I think, something like 400 pounds annually, which compared to maybe 40 pounds annually, it was attractive for that reason. Now, it seemed from your book, Sarah Gray Carey from Boston to Grenada, that Samuel did find work in the West Indies. By 1772, he was back in Boston. So do we know what kind of work Samuel undertook in the West Indies and why he returned to Boston by 1772? In 1769, his father died. And so he came to settle the estate and then came back, I think, in 1770. And then he stayed for a while to settle the estate with his brothers. And then he went back. So he was initially on St. Christopher's or St. Kitts. And within a year, he was a plantation manager for two prominent merchants, John Borio and Charles Spooner. They were absentee owners. And then in a moment of transition, John Borio offered Samuel Carey Sr. the position of a plantation manager for the Simon estate in Grenada. And so he was juggling that job offer with having to settle the estate of his father. And that's one reason why he was only there for a short period of time. And then he returned to Grenada. And although it sounds like Samuel was weighing this decision, he ultimately decides to move to Grenada and become the plantation manager of the Simon estate. Now, could you tell us more about Grenada? Because 
Sarah and Samuel marry in 1772, and by 1774, they left Massachusetts to remove to Grenada. So would you tell us more about the island? Right. So Grenada was a combination of coffee plantations and then sugar plantations. And then when the sugar trade was more lucrative, it went over more to sugar. It had been in French hands and then went back to British hands and then French hands. And so it has a complicated colonial history, of course. The island itself isn't very big. I better not quote, but I think something like 32 miles in length. And Sarah talks about when she writes that when I talk about this island and the beautiful prospects, that's pretty much it, you know? So there was a network of families that had moved over there from London and from Scotland when Samuel initially moved over there. So there was a family group that she could connect with. The African population was much larger than the Anglo population. But for a while, it was a successful sugar plantation industry, basically. Mid-18th century Grenada sounds very different from mid-18th century Boston. You're right. It was such a striking contrast, you know, to go from the excitement of Boston to the relative calm or simplicity of Grenada. Yeah. And we should talk about the transition that Sarah and Samuel made from life in Boston to life in Grenada, because by 1774, they had removed to the island. So do Sarah's letters reveal anything about what it was like for her and her family to move from Massachusetts to the island of Grenada? They do. So they decided to leave their son, three months old, Samuel Jr., with her mother because of the potential for tropical fevers and diseases. So later she writes this really long letter to her son upon his 30th birthday, you know, really revisiting that and how painful of a choice it was for her. And in hindsight, she wished she hadn't done that. So she was in agony of leaving her infant, but she was also excited to be reunited with her husband. And it was a shock to her. I don't know what she could have imagined, but she wasn't anticipating the isolation that she would feel. Wow, that must have been really difficult. Was there anything more to that decision for Samuel and Sarah to leave their three-month-old son in Massachusetts while they moved to Grenada? I mean, it seems like a really big decision. And I wonder if it was solely based on the fact that there were these tropical diseases and they posed danger. Right. She and her husband debated it. And, you know, even in Samuel Sr.'s health issues, he often suffered from the fevers of the islands. And it just basically seemed dangerous. They had no inclination of how prolonged the war would be. They thought it would be a temporary separation. They never imagined it would be 18 years. And it would be another 10 years before they would see their son again. But again, the initial impulse was it seemed precarious to bring an infant into that environment. Right. The war. Because we are talking about 1774, a time when Boston was in the throes of the American Revolution. So... Was it the revolution and the war for independence that kept the Carries in Grenada and away from their son for 10 years and away from Massachusetts for 18 years? Because the war only lasted between 1775 and 1783. So what accounts for the extra time they spent away? Well, they didn't plan on it, right? You know, very dramatically, when Sarah left in January, the rivers were frozen. It was sort of the last flight out of Boston because then the British closed the port in retaliation of the Tea Party. That was unanticipated. And then they couldn't really return, not only because Sam Carey had obligations with the Simon Plantation, but it was unsafe for them to return. And there was like a two-year gap in letters. Sarah complains bitterly about that. You know, I've written all these letters. No one's writing back to me. She knows her letters are being intercepted. And again, they did not imagine that that would happen to them. That's right. I guess it would have been impossible for the Carries to know that the American Revolution was going to turn into the war for independence and that their lives would be disrupted as much as they were. Do Sarah's letters discuss what it was like for the Carries to weather the war for independence in Grenada, separated as they were from friends and family in Massachusetts? So they were sympathetic to the Patriot cause, but they were compliant with the British rulership in Grenada. Sam McCary was part of a council. Margaret writes about her father speaking his mind, but then people sort of warning him not to be too overt. They were learning about the war through letters from friends. They were concerned about the war. The interruption of trade to the islands, the cost of sugar was depressed, was plummeting. So 
it was definitely economically disruptive for the West Indies in general, but certainly to Grenada. And then once everybody knew that the revolution was over, Sam McCary wrote a really interesting letter to his friends about, you know, celebrating the American cause. So that was interesting too, the identity of being colonial subjects, and then suddenly not immediately embracing the idea of being an American citizen. But then they stayed, to kind of go back to your earlier question, they stayed even longer because they decided to send their four-year-old daughter, Margaret, to London for education. And Samuel Carey writes letters to his contacts in London to explain that he also understood this would prolong their stay in Grenada. That's a really interesting point and observation that we do have this family from Boston who sided with the revolutionaries and yet circumstances beyond their control force them to spend the war for independence living in a British territory. But then after the revolution, their behavior is also really interesting because rather than go home to American-controlled Massachusetts, they choose to continue on living in British-governed Grenada. I mean, it sounds like the Carries wanted to be both citizens of the United States and subjects of the British Empire. Exactly right. And so even when they return in 1791, it was more advantageous for Samuel Carey to retain some of his ties to England because of his business connections. So I don't know if you say he became an American citizen, but taking American citizenship, he delayed that for, again, for his business reasons. But once they returned, it didn't seem to be a difficult transition for Sarah. She was very glad to be back, reunited with her extended network of family and close female friends. We should definitely talk about the Carey's return to Massachusetts in 1791. But before we do that, would you tell us about the Carey's daily life in Grenada? What was their life like on this island? And what kind of routines did they have? So the family stayed in two locations. So they were with their father in Simon, but during the rainy months, which was from like January to I think May, they went to Mount Pleasant, which was up in the hills. And then the father would come home on Sundays and be with them. It seems like Sarah, you know, again, raising her large family was very committed and occupied with their education and their upbringing, whereas Samuel Carey was definitely involved with the day-to-day business operations of the plantation. So what I know about their daily life, interestingly enough, is from her letters to her son. When he returned to London, he took up an apprenticeship with the Morris and Postawate firm. And they were only living about 20 miles apart, but they would have servants send letters back and forth. So that gave me insight into her daily life, which was pretty routine, taking care of her children, taking walks, taking horse rides, and visiting with the women in her neighborhood. It sounds like the Carries had a fairly typical upper-class island lifestyle. Like, they had multiple plantations where they presumably grew lucrative cash crops like coffee and sugar, and these servants to send letters to each other when they couldn't be together. And I do wonder about these servants and just how typical the Carey's plantation lifestyle was like. Did the Carey's own and used enslaved people to help create and sustain their wealth? Right. So they held slaves in Mount Pleasant Plantation, and then the Simon Plantation also had slaves. You know, you asked me earlier about my sources. Reading Samuel Carey's Mount Pleasant ledger book was really interesting. The details, not only about his allocations for clothing, but also for medical concerns. If one of his female slaves was pregnant or giving birth. And then in the world of slavery, which, as you know, is really difficult to fathom and to understand and just how that could happen in the first place, but also the ways in which, especially Sam Carey, presented himself or tried to be more of a benevolent slaveholder, which sounds like a contradiction. In one of his letters, as he was trying to navigate managing the Mount Pleasant plantation while he was in Boston, he writes that he wanted his slaves to stay together as a family. He mentions them by name. Again, I'm not condoning slavery, but it's just these subtle marks that seem to be different from simply the business of slavery that were interesting as well. And what about the number of enslaved people? Did Samuel's day books reveal anything about the number of enslaved people he had on these two different plantations? I want to say for the Mount Pleasant Plantation, probably not more than 20. The Simon Plantation was more extensive, and I don't have a figure in my head right now, but I would imagine it was in the hundreds. Now, as you mentioned earlier, the Careys did return to Massachusetts in 1791. 
Do we know what finally prompted their return to New England and what the return to Massachusetts meant for their lives as planters in Grenada? Right. A couple of factors there. Even though Borio had helped Samuel Carey establish himself in Grenada and had lent him some money so he could buy his own plantation on the west coast of the island called Mount Pleasant, it was never a legal document. So it was in litigation. He had to work with lawyers to try to prove that he had ownership to Mount Pleasant and that his plantation manager position was solvent. And so there's a lot of correspondence back and forth to the lawyers in London and then trying to, you know, keep everything working. And then the other really complicated moment was John Borio's will was contested for almost 20 years. So even though Kerry became the plantation manager of the sign of the state, it was always in doubt whether it was actually going to be sold or not. So unfortunately, the Mount Pleasant plantation never really became their sort of retirement fund. So after that 20 years of litigation, yes, it was finally going to be sold. So I was tracking this down with various advertisements in the British gazettes, you know, how many times it was being sold. So that sale was pending. They were getting older. Samuel Jr. was now 18 years old, and they brought him back when he returned to serve as an apprentice so that he could take over the family plantation. So that sort of all seemed to be falling into place at once. So the plan was to maintain these plantations as long as possible and to use Samuel Jr. instead of Samuel to actually manage the family's plantations. Exactly, right. Now, many of the letters you examined in your book, Sarah Gray Carey from Boston to Grenada, were letters between Sarah and her eldest son, Samuel Jr. Would you tell us about their relationship and their correspondence? So there was about 62 letters between Sarah and Samuel between 1790 and 1803. They wrote about everything, as I I mentioned earlier, just about everyday matters. She was really keen to guide him. And so they talked about classical philosophy, but also she was mentoring him on his behavior, on his, you know, spiritual training. So again, they seem to fluctuate in just one letter on various topics. He didn't always like her (laughs) advice, but he always acknowledged it. So he was a very compliant, dutiful son. Could you give us a few examples on the kinds of advice that Sarah would give to her son? Anything from very specific things to, I hear that you look pale, get some fresh air, you know, go outside. She advised him on his diet and sort of of the day, you know, just the general warnings about dissipation. So not excess of any kind. She always couched that with, I know I don't need to tell you this, but just in case you need a reminder. So he wasn't really keen on staying with the family. There's a really emotional exchange. She wrote to him three times on the day they were leaving. She didn't want to see him because she didn't want to, what she said, unman him. But she was very torn. And he wrote to her one of his first letters back to Boston, to Chelsea. You know, why didn't you see me on the last day? And so it seemed like she wanted him to be a strong gentleman, you know, of that era and not be a burden to him on a certain level. So there was that going on. Later, when they picked up their correspondence, he mentioned marriage and she was immediately concerned about that because they really relied on Samuel Jr. to look after the family fortunes. And much later, she said, you know, I think this is probably a good time for you to get married. That was like, 15 years later. So they did touch on personal matters as well. And what about her move back to Massachusetts? Did Sarah ever tell Samuel Jr. what it was like for her and the rest of the family to move back to Boston and Chelsea after spending nearly 20 years in Grenada? Right. I mean, in her letters to Samuel Jr., they were more focused on his businesses. When she did write to Mercy Otis Warren and others, it seemed like it was not a difficult transition. They were very glad to be back. Their children could be educated locally. They obviously no longer need to send their children to London. So the word rejoicing comes to mind in terms of how she considered their return. How about Phaedon's rebellion? Did Sarah ever write to her son Samuel Jr. about this March 1795 slave revolt in Grenada and how it may have impacted his management of the Carey's plantation and the family's finances? When they returned, there was a letter that Samuel Carey Jr. had written that they had a comfortable fortune. So they returned sort of triumphantly to Chelsea and 
They called their home the retreat, and it became a gathering place for the Boston elite. It didn't last that long because then when the rebellion came in you know, March 2nd, 1795, it upended the sugar trade in Grenada. And the cause of it, in just sort of in a broad overview, was the rebellion of the Catholic and French landholders against the British. They were imposing concessions that the French had rolled back. And so it was a rebellion inspired to some extent by the French Revolution of confronting authority and a fight for more social equity. And so Fidon himself, Julian Fidon, was a landholder. He was a free black. He was a mulatto and inspired also by Victor Hughes. So it was a very significant rebellion, also inspired maybe in part by the Haitian Rebellion Revolution. So the Careys had returned from their time in Grenada fairly well off, and then there was this slave revolt. How did they respond to the financial blow that Fadon's rebellion had caused them? Were they ever able to recover the loss of their plantation income? No, it was devastating. Not only to them, over 35 coffee estates were destroyed. It took about two years for their Mount Pleasant plantation to recover, and they never recovered. So there's a lot of references to Sam McCary, you know, living out his later life very distraught. You know, he tried very hard to make the Chelsea home productive as a sort of family farm, but they became extremely dependent on Samuel Jr. to travel extensively around the West Indies. He created these really amazing networks of merchants. He tried very hard, and then later his brother Lucas joined him. But no, they never regained the level of wealth that they had had when they returned in 1791. So it sounds like Sarah and Samuel Sr. really relied on their sons to help remake the family fortune. Was this typical in early America, where parents relied so much on their adult children for financial support? It doesn't seem to be unusual for the sons to depart, whether they were going westward in colonial and then the New Republic, just to separate and establish themselves. It seemed to be that there were other young men that Samuel Carey Jr. associated with in his travels, it seems unusual that they would have been separated for so long and that they would be so dependent on their sons. I haven't done an extensive search of this, but this particular situation does seem remarkable, if not unique. So what were the ramifications of this family dynamic? What did it mean for Samuel Sr. and Sarah as older people to rely so heavily on their sons for financial support? and? What did it mean for their sons to really need to provide financial support for their parents? Right. Samuel Jr. was somewhat successful. The Mount Pleasant Plantation, unfortunately, never really became lucrative. Lucas later came and helped him out. But it was really the kind of the second layer of sons that actually became much more successful. Henry Carey became a very wealthy and successful merchant in New York and then his other brother, Edward, and eventually the second oldest son, Charles, became treasurer of Chelsea. So all through her remaining life, Sarah and her husband were dependent on their sons, but they had to scale back when there's talks about having to pull their children out of school, educate them at home. And there's really a touching letter from Samuel Carey Jr. to his sister, Margaret, saying, I know you've never had to experience any difficulties in your life. And apparently the people that were visiting them from Boston, not shunned them, but were less likely to come visit them. And so in the larger scale of things, it doesn't seem like they were suffering very much. But Samuel Carey Jr. was aware that the family had never experienced anything like that as the ramifications of the rebellion and then the downsizing of the sugar plantations in Grenada itself. Could you tell us a bit more about Samuel Sr. and Sarah's retirement in Massachusetts? It really sounds like many of their sons helped take care of the family business and supported them financially, but what more do we know about the later years of Samuel Sr. and Sarah's lives? So there are some letters that are interesting about Sarah telling you know Samuel that they go on horseback rides every day for like almost two hours. They sit in the parlor, they read aloud. The family was a very active readers. There's a really charming scene where they're reading The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe, and Samuel Sr. peeks out the window and yells, it's snowing, and then the youngest daughter screams. So just had this really interesting family life, uh, very closely knit, the activities that they would engage in, 
it seemed like a love match, as we would say, between Sarah and Samuel. So even though they did suffer a reversal of fortune, their daily lives were, they had a regular rhythm to them, and they seemed very content to sort of pull back and not be as engaged with the life of Boston. When Samuel comes to visit after the rebellion, he goes to Philadelphia for a short time. Sarah writes, I'm glad that you decided not to participate in the Boston social circles, but to recruit your health instead. So they seem to have adjusted to their life, their somewhat more rural life in Chelsea at the time. Now to fast forward a bit to 1810, Samuel Jr. died in 1810 at the age of 37. And in 1812, just two years later, his father Samuel Sr. died. Susan, did Sarah ever write about how these deaths of her eldest son and her husband impacted her and how the deaths may have impacted the financial future of the Carey family? Very dramatically. And again, it's a very poignant or tragic scene when Samuel Carey Jr., he had just finished the negotiations to sell Mount Pleasant. He was looking forward to returning to Boston. And then he died weeks before he landed. And it was absolutely unexpected. So then they needed to figure out how they were going to retain their connections. And that's where they became much more dependent on Lucas. Then when Samuel Carey Sr. died, Sarah became even more dependent. It sounds like they had some legacies from the wills, especially for the younger women in the family, but they were never, as I mentioned before, secure or wealthy position until Henry Carey seemed to be able to provide for the family in ways that took up the gap where Samuel had been doing that. So was Sarah ever able to live out her days independently, or did she have to move in with one or more of her children until her death? The women stayed, Margaret Carey stayed, and some of her sisters stayed with Sarah, and they stayed throughout the 19th century until later they sold the farmland around it. They had like 125 acres. They had a brick company that they engaged in. So the Carey house is still there. I did visit it a couple of years ago. As you can imagine, you know, you can get this image of an 18th century house, right? And so to then go there, it was a lovely visit. We had a wonderful tour of the house itself. The dimensions of the house really were interesting to me, how relatively small it was. So you can imagine Sarah surrounded with her family in the parlor, you know, exchanging letters and walking around in the orchards that were around there. Now, when you look back over the course of this entire project and you look at the broader revolutionary and early republic periods, what do you think the experiences of Sarah Gray Carey can tell us about these periods? What does her life and experiences tell us about revolutionary America and the early republic? I just think how unexpected it was and how it was unfolding in ways that no one could really imagine and just how dramatically it was going to change not only their status, but it highlighted their feeling of isolation as subjects while they were on the island. And then to return, I think, you know, it was like a time travel or a time warp where suddenly they had to sort of catch up with things that were happening. But the franticness when going back to the rebellion of kind of trying to figure out what was happening to Samuel, and then later trying to navigate or negotiate what it meant to be a family. I mean, the other part that's striking to me about this is the only time that she actually spent with her son were these almost two years while he was living on Grenada. Otherwise, her relationship with her son Samuel was a correspondent relationship. So as far as understanding the revolution through their eyes, that was also a part of the correspondence that I just thought was really interesting. Now, speaking of time warps, we should really jump into ours. The time warp is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Susan, in your opinion, what might have happened if Samuel and Sarah Carey had not spent the war for independence in Grenada? How might the trajectory of the Carey family and its fortunes have been different? I think that Samuel Sr. would have become a merchant living in Boston. I think he still wanted to go to the West Indies at some point. But again, the connection to Sarah, because when he came back and he met her and then they had an engagement, 
that changed the trajectory of his life. So it's hard to know whether or not he would have stayed in Grenada. But if they had not, I just imagine they would have settled in with the social elites of Boston area. So Susan, now that you've seen how the Carey family's history has unfolded, what are you researching and writing about now? Oh, well, I'm working on something that's, you know, definitely in the planning stages, but I'm interested in colonial Philadelphia and these oaths of allegiance that people had to, you know, subscribe to, especially those that were of the pacifist affiliations, Quakers or Mennonites or even the Amish. I made assumptions about how difficult that must have been. And now I'm learning that the difficulty wasn't in their allegiances to their pacifist states, but it was in signing an oath when they had already signed sort of the founding oaths when they came over with William Penn. And so I'm just really interested in that psychological element of what it meant to be living in revolutionary Philadelphia, where you are conflicted with the very cause that's surrounding you. So, And if we have more questions about Sarah Gray Carey, her letters and details about her family, how can we get in contact with you? The best way would be through my email at in my institution, which is S-I-M-B-A-R-R-A at mnstate.edu. Susan Claire Imbarato, thank you for joining us and for introducing us to the Carey family and their experiences during the Age of Revolutions. Thank you so much, Liz. I really appreciate it. The life and letters of Sarah Gray Carey are really interesting. They're interesting because not only do they reveal information about the past, they also reveal how we can use letters and the information they contain to do history. Now, as Susan told us about Sarah Carey's letters, she gave us many examples of how letters can provide us with a window onto the life and times of people from the past. For example, through the window left to us by Sarah Carey's letters, we can see just how unexpected the American Revolution and War for Independence were for many Americans. This is something that comes through quite clearly in Sarah's letter to her eldest son, Samuel Jr., on Samuel Jr.'s 30th birthday. This letter from Sarah reveals that she and her husband chose to leave Samuel Jr. behind with his grandmother because they really feared he might contract and succumb to a dangerous tropical disease. This letter also reveals that when Samuel and Sarah made that decision to leave Samuel Jr. behind, they had no idea a war would separate them from their eldest son for the next nine to ten years. If Sarah and Samuel had known that fact, they probably would have taken Samuel Jr. with them. Now, it's easy for us to look back at the past and see it clearly. From our vantage point in the future, we can look back and see exactly how events would unfold. But the people who lived in the past we study didn't have our advantage. They had to live in the moment and wait and see how events would unfold. And often, that process took place with a lot of uncertainty. Now, we can also use the letters of Sarah Gray Carey to see the process of history at work. As Susan noted, letters contain information. That information can be direct or can be indirect. For example, the contents of a letter might provide you with a name, date, place, or event. Sometimes the letter writer might even elaborate on these names, dates, places, and events. But most of the time, we'll need to take the mentions the letter writer makes and use them to track down more information in other historical sources like books, newspaper articles, government records, business ledgers, journals and diaries, and the like. I mean, there are actually a lot of different historical record types that we can use to track down information. And this is part of the work of history. Our ability to use information provided in one source to track down information in another source so that we can better understand what happened and how people in the past acted. So what can a family history and the letters of a wife and mother tell us about life in the Caribbean and about life in revolutionary and early Republic America, it turns out they can tell us a whole lot. Look for more information about Susan, her book, Sarah Gray Carey, From Boston to Grenada, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 253. The Ben Franklin's World listener community is a place for people like you, people who love history and want to know more about the early American past. It's really easy to join the community. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com and click on the listener community button right on the homepage. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Emily Sneff, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, I know you conduct a lot of research for your history and genealogy projects, 
So I wonder, what are some of the most amazing or most helpful letters that you found? You know, those letters that really told you something about the people and events that you're researching? I'd love to know about your finds. So email me, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.